Aspiration pneumonia. Is dysphagia always to blame? So you see aspiration pneumonia listed in your patient's chart as a diagnosis. Oh no, they must have dysphagia then, right? Not necessarily. I'm going to tell you the difference between dysphagia-related aspiration pneumonia and non-dysphagia-related aspiration pneumonia and what you can look for to help differentiate between the two. Let's dive in. I'm Teresa Richard. I've been a medical speech pathologist for 15 years. I'm a board certified specialist in swallowing and swallowing disorders. I'm the founder and CEO of the MedSLP Collective and MedSLP Education. Dysphagia related aspiration pneumonia is what medical SLPs are the most familiar with because it's exactly that, aspiration pneumonia related to dysphagia. What are we specifically looking for when it comes to dysphagia related aspiration pneumonia? Consider the various causes of aspiration pneumonia. Aspiration pneumonia is anything other than air that enters the lungs. So it can be food, liquid, vomit, medication, but can also be saliva, secretions. Does the patient have any diagnoses that can cause dysphagia? Was there a known diagnosis of dysphagia prior to pneumonia? What does the patient say? Did they notice symptoms of dysphagia prior to the onset of their pneumonia? Was there a vomiting event prior to developing pneumonia? Dig into that chart review, interview the patient and family members, and try to investigate whether or not dysphagia has a role in this. I have a colleague who saw a patient who was a frequent flyer in the hospital with COPD, meaning they, they're admitted often. She came into the hospital for acute exacerbation of COPD and pneumonia. She didn't have any symptoms of dysphagia though. Because she knew the relationship between COPD, airway protection, and dysphagia, she requested a consult, did the video fluoroscopy, and saw she was silently aspirating. So she started dysphagia therapy, and the patient's hospitalizations for pneumonia significantly decreased. This was a case where the medical team assumed she had non-dysphagia-related pneumonia. However, due to her wonderful knowledge, it nudged her to investigate dysphagia-related aspiration pneumonia. Now, what is non-dysphagia-related aspiration pneumonia? While it's still pneumonia related to aspiration, dysphagia was not the cause of that aspiration. For example, aspiration of reflux, especially if the patient is taking acid-suppressing drugs. This allows for swallowed oral pathogens to thrive, and once those oral pathogens are refluxed and aspirated into the lungs, it can cause a non-dysphagia-related aspiration pneumonia. Other examples include an isolated event of choking or aspiration without symptoms of oropharyngeal dysphagia or aspiration of vomit, which you may see more in a cardiac arrest case. A few years ago, I was asked to assess a patient that was hemiplegic and unable to feed himself. Referral was made because the caregiver reported that he had been coughing continuously throughout his meals with both solids and liquids. On inserting the scope, I saw what essentially looked like hamburger meat. It was red, inflamed, bloody mess of pharyngeal space that was punctuated by reflux material and pools of secretions everywhere. It was the exact telltale signs of laryngopharyngeal reflux disease. While his swallowing was actually relatively functional and intact, I was surprised that we weren't seeing any major impairments, despite how ugly it looked. About four minutes into the study, a massive amount of reflux came up and caused him to start coughing incessantly. And the caregiver said, yep, that's what's been happening every meal. We were able to show the doctor ASAP the cause of this guy's difficulties, and we started treatment immediately for his out of control reflux. I'll be posting other videos just like this one that you won't want to miss. So make sure to hit that like and subscribe button and turn on the notification bell. Do you have any questions about dysphagia related aspiration pneumonia? Leave them in the comments below and we'll get them answered as soon as possible. Beware, sometimes a person can come in with no prior dysphagia and pneumonia, but their pneumonia then causes an acute and temporary dysphagia. Why, how does that happen? Could possibly be effects of medication, lethargy, acute encephalopathy, hypoxemia, malnutrition. This is why we must collect information about the whole person before and during the hospitalization. This includes collecting information from patient caregiver interviews, past medical history, medication list, chest imaging, labs like white blood cell count, neuroimaging, and any other report concerning for dysphagia or non-dysphagia related aspiration events. It's important for us as SLPs to remember that dysphagia is always as the result of some other diagnosis. Dysphagia is not a standalone diagnosis. 
This is what we refer to as the chicken or the egg phenomena with dysphagia, where a person may have a standalone aspiration event that leads to an acute pneumonia that then in turn affects breathing and the general strength of the patient in such a way as to promote swallowing difficulties. These patients also typically will start losing their ability to fight off infection due to an overtaxing of the system. I had a patient that came into an LTAC with community-acquired pneumonia. She became so frail and weak and was bedbound with an onset of rapid, shallow breathing. Her breathing patterns became so uncoordinated that she started having difficulty during her meals with the mistiming. She was coughing constantly. In this case, her respiratory coordination caused the dysphagia. So the question becomes, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Or to put it in our terms, the pneumonia or the dysphagia? We've got a free gift for you at metaslpcollective.com. Check out the free MetaSLP Collective clipboard kit for access to our chest imaging for SLPs resource. To get your free copy, head over to metaslpcollective.com forward slash clipboard. The link for this will be listed in the description below. We also have a robust and vibrant community of SLPs and mentors there to help you out with your toughest clinical cases.